Hi guys, happy first day of reading the best bad luck I ever had. Here is what the cover looks like. Of course, you don't have a copy in front of you, so you will just have to uh, follow along on my screen or your screen um, as I read. Uh, please keep in mind that just like the lessons out of the literature book, if you want to read it independently, you can mute me anytime you want, okay? You can pause it uh, to keep the pages up as long as you need to. You can fast forward, you can rewind, whatever you need to do. Uh, but for those of you that just want to follow along, kind of like we did with The Outsiders, that is what this is for. Uh, please pause it as often as you need to in order to fill out your character charts. Uh, I hope you have them in front of you or on a different tab if you're doing it on the computer, um, whatever's easiest for you, or if you're just taking notes, whatever you need to do, uh, because there are a lot of characters. And I'm not gonna stop like I did in The Outsiders. I'm just gonna continuously read because you guys have the power. Uh, you can pause anytime you need and write whenever you want to, okay? So I'm gonna skip forward the praise for this book. It's so good. Here we go. Whoops, I went too far. Chapter one, the new postmaster. Here we go. I've been wrong before. Oh, heck, if I'm being real honest, I've been wrong a lot. But I ain't never been so wrong as I was about Emma Walker. When she first came to town, I thought she was the worst piece of bad luck I'd had since falling in the outhouse on my birthday. I tell you, things were fine in Moundville before Emma got here. At least I thought they were. Guess the truth is you'll never know how wrong I was until I'm done telling and explaining, so I'd better just get on with the story. My real name is Harry Otis Sims, but everybody calls me Dit. See, when I was little, I used to roll a hoop down Main Street, beating, at it, beating it with a stick as I ran along. One day, two older boys tried to steal my hoop. I hit them with my stick and told them, Dit away! They laughed. You talk like a baby. Dit, dit, dit. The name stuck. There are ten children in our family. Deli... Della, Ollie, Ullman, Elman, Raymond, me, Earl, Pearl, Robert, and Lewis. That's just too many kids. There are never leftovers at supper, and you never get new clothes. We don't even get to go to the store for shoes. Mama just keeps them all in a big old barrel. When the pair you're wearing gets too tight, you throw yours in and pick out another one. With so many kids, sometimes I think my pa don't even know my name, since it's always Deli, Ola, Ullman, Elman, Raymond, uh, I mean, Dit. We all live in a big old house that Pa built himself right off Main Street in Moundville, Alabama. Most of the people in Moundville are farmers, just like Pa. Just about everything grows well in our rich, dark soil, but especially corn and cotton. Before I even had my nickname, Pa taught me how to count by showing me the number of ears to feed the mule. Of corn to feed the mule. Most, ev most evenings, my whole family, and just about everybody in town, gathers in front of Mrs. Pooley's general goods store to wait for the train. Mrs. Pooley is the meanest old lady I've ever met. She smokes, spits, and has a temper shorter than a bulldog's tail. But her store has a wide, comfortable porch and a great view of the train depot just across the street. The evening Emma came, Mrs. Pooley sat in her usual rocker, smoking a pipe with Uncle Wiggins. Uncle Wiggins ain't really my uncle. Everyone just calls him that. He's over 80 and fought in the war between the states. He only has one leg and one hero, General Robert E. Lee. Uncle Wiggins manages to work Lee's name into pretty much any old conversation. You might say, my, it's cold today, and he'd repeat, you think this is cold? General Lee said it didn't even qualify as, as a chill until your breath froze on your nose and made a little icicle. He had about five different stories of how he lost his leg, every one of them more entertaining. That night, I was listening to the version that involved him running five Yankees into a bear's den, and I, as I wound a ball of twine into a baseball... Of course, if I'd had the money, I could have bought a new ball at Mrs. Pooley's store. But if you wind twine real careful, it's almost as good as a real ball. The new postmaster was coming to town, and the grown-ups were as wound up as the, ki as the kids on Christmas. The postmaster was in charge of sorting and delivering the mail, but he also sent and received telegrams. This meant he knew any good gossip long before anybody else. The last postmaster had been a lazy good-for-nothing. Everyone had gotten the wrong mail two days late. He and his family had skipped town for refusing to pay their debts at Mrs. Pooley's store. I was excited, too. The new postmaster, Mr. Walker, was supposed to have a boy who was 12, just like me. I sure hoped he liked to play baseball. It was June 1917, and my best friend, Chip, had just left to spend summer with his grandma in Selma. My ball of twine got bigger and bigger till there was a small light far off in the distance. We all jumped up and ran across the street to the train depot. There was a flash of copper as the golden eagle on the top of the huge locomotive flew out of the night sky. The whistle howled. White st 
steam poured out of the engine like a, and the train came to a slow stop in front of the station. A few local men who worked in Tuscaloosa got off first. Next, a couple of townspeople who had been visiting relatives climbed down the steps. Finally, a thin girl nobody knew appeared in the doorway of the train. The girl looked about my age and wore a fancy navy dress. Her hair was carefully combed and pulled back into a neat braid tied with a red ribbon. She clutched a small suitcase as of smooth leather. She was also colored. Chapter 2, The Girl from Boston The girl stood in the doorway of the train as the whole town looked her over. My sister Pearl stared at her shoes, shiny black patent leather without a scuff on them. Pearl's ten years old and ain't never had a pair that, hadn't, that ain't been worn by two sisters before her. The girl's mother stepped into the doorway right behind her. She was colored, too, and wore a yellow dress made of a gauzy material. Mama later said it was organza. The girl and her mother stepped carefully down onto the platform. Her daddy got off last. He wore a tailored suit, walked with a limp, and was just as black as the rest of them. The man looked around and, in a crisp northern accent, asked, "'Is there a Mr. Sims here?' "'I'm Mr. Sims,' said Pa, looking a bit confused. "'I'm Mr. Walker,' said the man, holding out his hand. "'The new postmaster.' "'It got real quiet for a moment. "'Everyone stared at Mr. Walker. "'They is ends,' said Uncle Wiggins, just as loud as could be. "'Pa stepped forward then and shook Mr. Walker's hand. "'The boy's a girl,' I mumbled. "'Mama poked me with her elbow, then went to speak to Mrs. Walker. "'I scowled at the girl. "'What's your name?' "'Emma,' she said, and scowled right back.' Mama made me carry home Emma's trunk in my old wagon. We had a cabin on our property that we always rented out to the new, to the postmaster and his family. I didn't understand how one little girl could have more stuff than me and all my brothers. You play baseball? I asked as we walked. No, Emma said. She shook her feet as she walked, trying to keep the dust off her fancy shoes. I've got a real glove. I tugged at the wagon. The only one in town. Maybe down south girls play baseball, she answered, but we're from Boston. I didn't say nothing. She pulled at the ribbon in her hair. You probably don't even know where that is. Kentucky, I answered. I ain't stupid. Emma slowed down to, to walk beside her mama. Mama, Emma said loud enough for me to hear. Why do we have to come down south? Emma, Mrs. Walker said softly. I've already told you. Daddy can't protest where they send him. There ain't many Negroes in the postal service. Emma glanced at me, then back at her mama. I don't think I'm going to like it here. It's only for a year, Mrs. Walker continued. Then Daddy can ask for a transfer. A whole year? I thought that was a long time to wait for another postmaster. But maybe then we'd finally get a boy. Next morning at breakfast, I sat down next to Ullman. He's four years older than me and real smart. I leaned over to him and asked, Boston's in Kentucky, ain't it? No, he said. It's in Massachusetts. Oh, I answered. I was suddenly mighty interested in my scrambled eggs. Chapter 3, Doing the Wash. After breakfast, I did my chores. All of us kids have jobs, except little Richard and Lewis, who are only four and two. Mine are to bring coal into the house, chop wood, drive the cows to pasture in the morning, and bring them home in the evening. We always have at least three cows, so we'll have enough milk and butter. Our main pasture is across the railroad tracks, and those stupid cows always stop right over the iron rails. I have to beat the cow with a switch to get them to move on. Raymond is our main milker. He's 14, and everybody says I look just like him, except my hair is red and his is brown. He's a bit taller, and his nose is bigger, and I'm much better looking, but other than that, we could be twins. The morning after Emma came, I had finished my chores and was getting ready to go off hunting when Mama asked me to come help with the washing. Of course, it wasn't a request, it was an order, but grown-ups like to pretend that they are being all reasonable even when they ain't. Washing was usually Della and Ollie's job. They're 19 and 17 and just about all grown up. Mama said they were both in bed because their friend had come to visit. Now, I don't get to stay in bed when my friends come over, but when I told Mama that, she told me to stop being fresh and go outside. Ten-year-old Earl and Pearl had been drafted into helping, too. They really are twins, but they are as alike as a chicken and a chipmunk. Earl's the chipmunk, quiet and watching everything, while Pearl's the one poking her beak into everybody's business. I felt a little better when I saw them helping because I hate doing the washing. Stirring that stupid old pot till your hands go numb? Rubbing all the water out on the wringer till your fingers are as wrinkled as the wet sheets. It's almost as bad as churning butter, and even Mama agrees that's the worst chore of all. The wash pot is huge, and we all have to and we have to pull up every bucket of water from our well. Pearl was pulling as fast as she could, but it would take forever if I let her do it. I grabbed the rope and began to yank yank it like a halt like the halter of a stubborn mule. The bucket came over the lip, 
of the well and sloshed a mouthful of water all over Pearl. I laughed as she wiped at her face with her skirt. Earl was trying to keep the huge fire going under the big black pot. It took a lot of heat to boil all that water. It seemed like I had pulled about up about a hundred buckets and spilled two more of them on Pearl by the time Mama had come time Mama had come out of the house. She was balancing balancing a huge load of sheets on her hip. Even after ten kids, Mama's long hair was still brown, mostly, and though her hands were wrinkled, her eyes were sharp. I thought she was real pretty, even if she wasn't skinny like Mrs. Walker. While we were working, Emma was sitting on her front porch, lazing about. This irked me to no end, so I came up with a plan. Traveling, you sure do get dusty, I said in a loud voice. Mama ignored me. Remember how you used to share the washing with the last postmaster's wife? Be nice to do that again, I admitted. Or I admit I was sassing her a little, but I don't care who helped as long as it wasn't me. Bet the new neighbors have a whole mess of clothes to wash. Mama glared at me and threw the sheets into the pot. Earl stirred them with an old broom handle. Pearl whispered, they is Negroes, dit. Mama glanced over at the cabin. Emma sat in a rocking chair watching us. Your mama home? Mama called over to Emma. Yes. Emma glided back and forth in her chair like she was bored. Tell her I'd like to speak to her. Took Emma a minute to get up as if she was thinking of disobeying mama, but finally she disappeared into the house. Pearl's eyes got big as a hoot owl's. Our clothes are going to end up all black and dirty, she said. Hush, child, said mama. Mrs. Walker came out of the house, drying her hands on a white starched apron. Did you want something, Mrs. Sims? Mama rubbed her hands over the front of her own dirty dress. Earl forgot to stir. Mama said, I was wondering, Mrs. Walker, if you wanted to do some laundry. Excuse me? Mrs. Walker arched her eyebrows. Thursday's wash day around here, Mama explained. Mrs. Sims, I am not your maid. What? asked Mama. Just because we're renting this house from you does not mean that you can order me around. Mrs. Walker sounded like she was talking to a small child. Mama rubbed a soapy hand across her forehead. But why is this so hard for you to understand? I am not doing your wash. I started to laugh. My mama ain't asking you to do the washing, I said. Mama turned as red as one of the tomatoes in the garden. Hush, dit. If Mrs. Walker d don't want to do her clothes with ours, that's fine. Just more work for her. Mama walked back toward the pot, grabbed the broom handle from Earl, and began stirring furiously. Emma took a step forward. You mean you wanted to do it together? She asked. That's what I said, ain't it? Mama answered. She continued to stir. Mrs. Walker pursed her lips. Our clothes are rather dusty from the trip, she admitted. Mama gave a weak smile. Dit, you can go now. I grinned. My plan had worked. But why don't you show Emma around while me and, me and Mrs. Walker wash the clothes? Not quite what I had expected. But Pearl... Pearl's got to change her clothes, Mama said without looking at me. Someone got her all wet filling the laundry tub. Now Mama looked at me and I knew I was stuck with Emma. Emma didn't seem too pleased either. She folded her arms across her chest. I didn't play with white boys in Boston. Well, darling, Mama said, things is a little bit different down here. Chapter 4, The Mounds When Mama told me to go play with Emma, I decided to take her to the top of my favorite mound. See, Moundville gets its name from the huge mounds of dirt that are spread out along the trees, 26 mounds in all. Pa says they were built by Indians carrying baskets of dirt and dumping them out, one on top of the other. Some of our mounds are over 60 feet high, so that's a lot of dirt. Don't know why the Indians built them mounds. Ullman said something about a temple for heathen gods. Ullman claimed they needed a lookout. But if you ask me, I say it was a scheme come up with by some old woman to punish naughty children. Ain't nothing worse than hauling dirt. Only took a couple of minutes for me to lead Emma through a field and a bit of wood to my mound. This was the place I went when I wanted to be alone. It was the tall it wasn't the tallest mound, but it had the best view when you climbed to the top. The mound was steep and covered with pricker bushes, which made it hard to climb. I figured Emma wouldn't like getting sweaty and dirty and that climbing the mound would be the best way to get rid of her. Sure enough, Emma took one look at the steep grassy hill and shook her head. No thank you, she said. No, thank you what, I said, playing dumb. I'm not really that interested in climbing your mound after all. Please take me home. I'm going up, I said, but you're free to go back on your own. Emma turned on her heel and marched back toward the woods. When she reached the edge, she paused and glanced at me again. I'm not sure I know the way. Then I'd best you, I guess you'd better come up with me. Emma took one long, one last longing look at the woods, then trudged back over to where I was standing. Okay, then, I said. Now, as you may see, this mound is kind of steep, so what you need to do is hold on to the base of these shrubs and use them to pull yourself up. 
I demonstrated, scrambling a few feet up the mound. Emma grabbed a couple of leaves and pulled. The branch she was clutching broke off and she tumbled to the ground. The base, I said. You grab the leaves, they'll fall right off. Emma nodded and tried again. This time, she got a pricker bush. She screamed and let go, falling down to, into the dirt again. I shook my head. Tears formed in her eyes as she held up her hand as if it were broken. I don't think I can do this. Shoo, you haven't even given it a try. This girl was more of a baby than I expected. But if you're going to cry about it, forget it. You can wait here and I'll pick you up on my way home. No, said Emma. She stuck her finger in her mouth and pulled out the thorn with her teeth. I'm not a crybaby. I started up the hill and Emma followed as best she could. By the time we got to the top, Emma only had a couple more scratches on her hands, but she was complaining like she was taking a bath with bees. If this is what you do for fun around here, Emma said as she tried to brush the smudge of dirt off her dress, I'm never going to leave my front porch. Fine with me, I thought, but all I said was quit your whining and led Emma to the edge of the mound to see the view. The tops of the trees were as bushy and soft as green dyed cotton. The Black Warrior River wound lazily through the forest. The fields of corn spread out in shades of brown and beige. Between the fields, a train chugged along, tooting its horn and letting off a stream of smoke. The sun shone down through hazy clouds that caused everything to shimmer. Wow, Emma breathed. I knew what she meant. I had seen this view a thousand times, but it still made me feel big and small at the same time. Emma shook her head. Her mama had, had plaited her hair into little braids and tied the ends with bits of ribbon. I take it back, Emma said. This view is worth the scolding I'm going to get when my mama sees my dress. I frowned. She wasn't supposed to like it that much. This was my place and I didn't need no company. Want to see something else? I asked. Sure. I took my flip it out of my back pocket. This was a slingshot I had made by wilting down an old stick till it had two strong prongs and a comfortable handle. This particular one I had made out of a piece of driftwood from the Black Warrior. I cut a strip of rubber from an old automobile tire and a little piece of leather from the tongue of an old shoe and tied them together. With my flip it, I could hit just about anything. Find me a little stone, I said to Emma. She picked, up, she picked one up and handed it to me. See that bird, I said, pointing to a yellow hammer, picking ants off a nearby tree. The yellow hammer is actually a kind of woodpecker with bright yellow feathers under its wings that are only visible when it flies. They are as common as ants in Moundville. Yes, Emma, an Emma answered. I put the rock in my flip it and let it fly. The bird was stretching out its neck for another ant. When the rock hit it, the yellow hammer fell to the ground. You killed it, Emma gasped. Yeah, I said, grinning. Everyone was always real impressed with my flip it skills. Emma looked at me like I was a pig with slop all over its face. Then she turned and ran toward the fallen bird. I caught a glimpse of its yellow feathers as she picked it up. Want me to get another? I called out. Emma didn't answer. She had a stick in one hand and was trying to dig a hole in the ground. What are you doing? I asked. You killed it, she repeated. You bury it in the ground, it's just gonna rot. What do you want to do with it? The frown on her face let me know she was definitely not a pig lover. I'm gonna feed it to the eagle. Emma put her hands on her hips. I don't see an eagle. So I wrapped up the bird in a large leaf, tucked in my pocket, tucked it in my pocket, and led Emma down the mound to Bigfoot's house. Bigfoot was the town sheriff, a large man, tall as one of our mounds, as mean and mean as a hooked snapper. He lived in a small wooden house given him by his mama, Mrs. Pooley, who owned the general store. The house had been well built once, but now it was in need of a new paint job and the front porch was beginning to sag. In one corner of the yard was a large iron cage where an old eagle slept with her head tucked under her wing. I rapped on the bars to wake the bird up, then threw the dead yellow hammer into the cage. The leaf wrapper fell away. The eagle lifted her head and devoured the bird in a few messy bites. Emma put her hand to her mouth like she was going to throw up. Are you feeling all right? I asked. You should have let me bury it. <laughs> Why? That bird just tore the other one apart. I shrugged. She's got to eat. Well, it's disgusting. Bet you don't look too pretty chewing your food up either. Emma ignored me. You shouldn't keep an eagle in a cage anyway. They're supposed to fly free. Poor bird. Poor bird, I asked. I just gave her a delicious supper. I wouldn't want a free supper if it meant I had to be locked up in a cage. She stroked the side of the cage with one finger, then gave me that look again. I'd had just about enough. Don't you look at me like I'm some old so. Emma tipped her head like a confused dog. An old what? A pig, after I was nice enough to show you around. You weren't that nice, she snapped back. You didn't warn me about the thorn bushes. She held up her scratched hands. She had a point. Who's there? A voice suddenly called out. We both took a step back. 
Bigfoot came out onto his porch carrying a shotgun. Though it wasn't a Sunday, he wore a white sh shirt with a starched collar. Bigfoot always had a clean shirt on, I'll give him that. Either Mrs. Pooley still did her son's laundry, or she'd taught him to wash and iron it them himself. It's me, Dit, I said. I was just feeding your eagle. Bigfoot glanced at me, then looked over at Emma. You the new Negra girl? he asked finally. Yes, said Emma. You say yes, sir, to a white man around here. Emma said nothing. Did I warned you about uppity Negras? That Elbert's bad enough. Don't you go be in friends with this one, too. Elbert was a color boy I went fishing with in the summer. Since Chip went to visit his grandma just about every year, I guess you could say Chip was my school friend and Elbert was my summer friend. But Elbert was 15, same age as my older brother, El Min, who had recently started acting strange. Pa had taught him how to drive, and all at once, El Min was more interested in chores and crops and being responsible than in fooling around with the rest of us. I was worried the same thing was going to happen to Elbert, which is why I'd been counting on the postmaster's son to be my backup. Ah, oh, Bigfoot, I said with a wave of my hand. My mama's making me show her around. We ain't friends. Bigfoot nodded and went back inside. Me and Emma walked home. She was awful quiet. When we reached her house, she didn't even bother to say goodbye.